uh, uh, some there was there was a um, I gave an explanation which the participants liked. So I'm going to give you an explanation why uh, I will take the time to give you a quick explanation of why path induction works. And I don't have any space here. Let's see how does this work. Oh, I could do this. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to insert here. So some people like this explanation. Why? I think my tablet got tired. Why does, it's as if it's losing CPU power. Why does path induction work? Maybe my hand is losing power. Okay, here's one explanation. So I said, you want to do something for an arbitrary path P from X to Y, where X and Y and P are all arbitrary, but you only need to check it for the identity path on X. So just the identity path is enough. Okay, here's one way of understanding why that's plausible. Because Y is allowed to move, there is a path from P to the identity path. Namely, I can make this path shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Or think of it as, you know, it's sitting at X. Here it goes to Y. Here it's sitting at X, then it goes to here. Then here it's sitting a little longer, then it goes to here. Anyhow, there will be a path from P to the identity path on X provided I'm allowed to move the endpoint. But if I'm allowed to move the endpoint, I can actually do this in a sort of a pathway way. Okay, but then I employ the homotopy invariance. I say, okay, I want to do something with P. But if I do it with the identity path, then I should be able to transfer whatever I'm doing with the identity path to P along this homotopy. That's why the, ident the, the path induction is not such magic. It's just, um, again, just, it really is just expressing the homotopy invariance principle that if I can do something, then I can, trans then I can transport it along a path. It's just doing that in the case of having a path with a loose endpoint. So that turns out to be the crucial case. And if you know a lot of homotopy theory, you will understand that that's, that, 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 that's something homotopy theorists know, of course, this sort of thing it gets used, it's, it's, it's really like a basic observation. And it should be because basic principles should be basic observations, okay? So I just wanted to spend three minutes explaining why, does, why path induction works because, there, because if, you, if you keep one endpoint at least, you see actually we didn't have to move X, but if, you put, if, you, if I'm allowed to move the endpoint of P, then I can have a path from P to the identity path. Okay, let's go on. The next important thing is called equivalences. And uh, here we're going to first do an intermezzo and finally address this function extensionality business, which is the following. Suppose I have two maps F and G from A to B, then define pointwise equal, point equal. So call this pointwise equal. I'll change the color so that Okay. Point wise equal, which means not that there is a path from F to G, but for every X in A, there is a path from F to G. So this is F and this is G. Then for every X, I get some path from F to, to say, well, this is F of X, this is G of X. And so for everyone, I get like this something, okay? It's very natural to expect that that means I have a path from F to G, not just a pointwise path. And in fact, we can go one way using path induction that if you have an honest path from F to G, then that will give you this pointwise path. At each point, there is one, okay? That's a nice exercise to do. But how about the other way around? The other way around is called function extensionality. 
and it states that if two things, if two maps are pointwise equal, then they're equal. Later on, when we explain univalence, it turns out that univalence implies function extensionality, but very often you want to work just with function extensionality. A function extensionality is kind of a, it's, it's uh, you see what it does is it explains the identity type of pi. So it explains what this is, because now we can go back and forth. We can go from the identity type to pointwise equivalence and back. Moreover, later when we define equivalences, we can do better and say that these two types are equivalent. So this, in a way, once you know that you have function extensionality, you have computed the identity type because this explains what the identity type on pi looks like. The identity type on the function space is just pointwise equivalence. So that's why it's important. It has lots of useful consequences for a mathematician. A programmer might be slightly more unhappy with it because it's saying that two maps are equal if they behave the same way. See, if on all arguments they behave the same way, then they're equal. Well, that's a very mathematical thing to think. Okay. Um, now let's ask a different question. So suppose I have a map F and I would like to know, I would like to say that it's an isomorphism or a bijection or equivalence or something. How do I say that? Okay. That, well, from set theory, we know that we have several ways. Okay. So one is to say that F has a two-sided, that F has an inverse. Okay. So number one is what you would normally say uh, if you said that F has an inverse. So you would say that you have a map G such that when you compose one way, you get the identity. And when you compose the other way, you get an identity. So that just means F is an isomorphism and G will be its inverse. And of course, now you should be asking, is this a property or a structure? And that's a very good question. So then there's another one. You could say every Y in B has exactly one pre-image. So how are we going to say that every point in, so because that's another way of saying that you have a bijection, right? A bijection means every point in the uh, codomain has exactly one pre-image. Okay, how do we, do, and I'm calling this one is equip. How do you say that? For any point Y in the codomain, this space is contractible because this is how you say has exactly one point. To say that something has exactly one point is to say that a certain space is contractible. What is the space? It's the space of all those X's, the space of all those X's, which map to Y. This is also call, called, this is also called the homotopy fiber. Of F at Y. Why? Because the homotopy reading of this is not that f of x exactly hits y. It just has to, there has to be a path. It, it lands in y up to a path. Okay, so then that, that's why you would call it homo, homotopy fiber. Fiber generally means some sort of an inverse image usually. Okay, so that's another one. Here's a third one, which is a bit odd because it seems unnecessary, is to say that it has that f has an inverse, but you allow it to have a different inverses. The left and the right inverse don't need not be the same, which seems silly, right? Because if you have these two inverses, you will also be able to show that they're equal. What happens is in this case that higher structure starts to matter. So here are some observations. First of all, the second one is a property, but the first one is not, is in general a structure. And you may wonder, well, but how could G, how could F have more than one inverse? I know from, you know, like kindergarten that if F has an inverse, the inverse is unique. Yes, the inverse is unique, but you need to ask whether these equalities are unique. If you want there to be exactly one way to have an inverse, not only should G itself be unique, but also the way in which it's an inverse needs to be unique. And that's where the problem lies. So it turns out that this one here is equiv is proper is a that's a property, but is iso is not necessarily a property. And this funny one that you have a left and right inverse, which sort of 
detaches the two inverses and says, oh yeah, you can have a different one in which this one is also a property and it's going to be equivalent to is equiv. So it's just another way of saying the same thing. So what should we think about this? And this is, by the way, I think a major contribution, a major observation by Vladimir Voivodsky uh, that this is the correct definition of equivalence in the type theory, because it would be very easy to naively expect that it doesn't matter, but these two types are not the same. I, is ISO and is equiv. And this one is preferable because it's a property, which means we don't have to keep asking ourselves that, oh, but what if it is an equivalence in a different way, you see? So it's important that we have, this is what makes it workable. This is what uh, saves us from having this constant worries that all this higher structure is somehow, you know, uh, making things complicated. No, if it's a property, that just means everything will collapse. And there is just one way in which we do it. We don't have to worry. So that's the preferred way of saying that two types are equivalent is to, to have an equivalence. So we can have two definitions. Is B in equivalent to is ISO? You mean, no, by in is equivalent to is equivalent. Oh, here. This, this one turns out to be the same as is equiv. By, I mean, it's equivalent to is. Is by in and is equiv are equivalent. So there are two things we're talking about. The bad one, which is ISO, and the other two, which are good, okay? So we will write this when A and B are isomorphic. And very importantly, this is in general a structure. So this one, remember, this is a structure. And of course, isomorphism, being isomorphic, of course, is a structure because there can be many isomorphisms from A to B. There can be many Fs. And being an, two types being equivalent, of course, is a structure. But at least we don't have some structure here and then even more structure here. At least we factor things out. There is structure here because there can be many equivalences. But then the rest is a property. So you don't have to worry about it so much. You just have to know that it's there and you don't care which one. Um, questions. Okay, what Egbert calls the fundamental theorem of identity. Okay, now I'm not going to address what Egbert calls the fundamental theorem. Is there a good topological counter example to ISO? Uh, yes, I'm sure there are. And I think uh, Joyal gave uh, such example, and he also noticed that number three is the same as number two at IIS, but I will not get into that now. Uh, maybe somebody offline on Discord can provide a topological counter example to is ISO. It's going to have to do with higher, with higher dimensions, with uh, higher cells, higher dimensional cells. Can you minus truncate the two sides of the product in is ISO to get an equivalent definition? So the question is, what happens if you start truncating here? And I don't know the, the top of my head. My intuition will tell me that you do a bad, that that's a bad thing to do. Um, and Egbert will probably be able to confirm if he's still here or somebody else. I would be suspicious of that, but it's also a good question to think about these things if you want to learn homotopy type theory. Okay, so our official definition of equivalence is from now on going to be that there is an equivalence in this sense of is equiv which is that F has the property that pre-image, every pre-image of a point is contractible, okay? However, in practice, if you want to show that two types are equivalent, but you don't care what the equivalence is, it suffices to show that they're isomorphic because there is a map which corrects, if you have an isomorphism structure, you can turn it into an equivalence property. There is a map like that, which we can't get into, which fixes, which does something to keep the same inverse, but it fixes the proof that the, you get, that the, the inverse really is an inverse. It fixes those proofs to make sure that you got yourself an honest equivalence. So um, there is a way to do that, which means that if you want just to know that A and B are equivalent, but you don't care by what equivalence, it's enough to 
construct just f and it's and, and a g and verify their inverses of each other and then you say okay if this is not an equivalence we know there is a way to fix it okay but if you care what it is then you better you're better off trying to do it directly produce a specific map and show that it's an equivalence okay what are some basic observations are the pi ones the same the pi ones are what Basil, what of the ISO and the equiv? Ah, okay. So the question here is, if you look at this, is ISO, I could project out this G. Is equiv, well, you don't quite mean the pi one, right? But you see, when I have F, if I know that F is an ISO, then it gives me this G as its inverse. But is equiv as, okay, so this is a very good observation. Now is the time to do it. Is counter says for all, right? It says that, oh, sorry. It says is counter will give me the center of contraction here. There will be a center of contraction. And that center of contraction will give me a point in A. So whenever you have an equivalence, you're going to get a map from B to A as well. Ooh, wow. Okay. So you're going to get a map like that. It wants to be a straight line. Okay. And so there will be an inverse to F and Basil is asking, is it the same as the one here? Well, the, the inverse part, the thing that happens to points, if it's there, it's unique. But the question is, in what way do you, the, the, the question is how, uh, how, what are the equalities witnessing that they are inverse, inverses of each other? So yeah, if there, is, if there is an inverse, it's unique up as a map. So the, question, the answer would be, yeah, it's the same one. Okay, did I answer the question? Okay, so now where were we? Oh, here, yeah, so equivalence is, equi okay, equivalence is, is an equivalence relation. Here, you can show that the identity map from A to B, from A to A is an equivalence. I wonder what happened to my uh, program because it refuses to draw smoothly. Uh, this is an exercise good that you can get an inverse map. And we were just discussing that, that there is an inverse map and it's an equivalence. And if you compose equivalences, you get an equivalence. So that's good to know. Um, just remember it this way right now, um, but the obvious things are there and uh, that in fact, we can turn them around, right? So this means if I have E here, then I get here some map E to the minus one and the proof, the pr this one is an equivalence and this one will also be an equivalence. Okay, okay. So what else? Uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, equivalence is 1735. Okay, we seem to be doing okay. Okay, what are equivalences good for? They're good for many things, but the one that I we can talk about is that equivalences can be used to express universal properties in this nice way where things happen up to homotopy. So let's look at that. Let's look at the notion of a product diagram. What does it mean that P is the product of A and B where with the given maps P1 and P2 as projections? There is a universal property, right? The universal property says for every R and every R1 and every R2 that exists exactly one H such that these triangles commute. It's something that you hope have seen. Um, Andre's use of computer system mathematics is to have a program improve his writing. Yeah, well, no, I think my handwriting was okay, but right now it's just, it's giving up. It's, it's, it's as if it got tired. Maybe, maybe I need to restart it. Yeah, my program got tired. Okay, so how in type theory would we express the universal property of a product? The fact that P is the product of, that P is the product of A and B. How would we do that? Okay, here's the recipe. The recipe is as follows. When you have a universal property, there is the easiest part of the property, which is the one which goes backwards. You see the hard part is that given R1 and R2, I need to cook up H. How will I get H given R1 and R2? That's where the meat is. That's where you get something out of the property. But there is also the boring part of the property. Namely, if I start with H, it's super easy to get R1 and R2 that correspond to this H. 
So there will always be this boring way of if you start with the thing that you want to have, it's very easy to find data that will give you that thing. And you define a map that does that. And then you say that map is an equivalence and you will have your universal property. So let's see how this works for products. Okay, so if I start with H, I say, okay, suppose I want, I have a given H that I want to get. What should I take for R1 and R2? So this will be a map which takes an H. Here's my H, right, H. And then it has to give me the map has to give me something. Well, what does it have to give me? It has to give me these two commutative triangles. So it has to give me R1 and alpha and R2 and beta. Here they are. So this map will take my H. It will give me suitable R1, suitable R2, such that the triangles commute. So it will give me the alpha and the beta as well. What will this map do? It will take H, which R1 works for the given H? Well, obviously you just take H composed with P1. If R1 is H composed with P1, then it all becomes trivial. So the R1 that works for the given H is P1, P1 composed with H. And then similarly for the other one. And then this is just identity. It's nothing because you get P1, P1, P1 H equals P1 H. So you just use the identity path. Okay, that was nice. That was easy. That was, if I already have the answer, I can get the input data. But now we say that we now we just look at what does it mean for this E to be an equivalence? What do we get? Okay. Well, you spell it out and you say, to say that this thing is an equivalence means that for everything in the image, so for everything, so here, this is the, this is the codomain and these here, these people here, they come from the codomain. For every element in this codomain, so that's gonna be a quadruple R1, R2, alpha and beta right, because alpha and beta are here, paths like that. So for everybody there, uh, the H fiber, the homotopy fiber is contractible, but what is the homotopy fiber? The homotopy fiber is you take all those maps H that are mapped to this particular quadruple. Now, this will give me an inverse map. Well, if this is an equivalence, it generates a map which takes this data and produces one particular H, namely the center of contraction. That's the inverse map. So the inverse map gives here the center of contraction. Well, that's the one that from given H, that's the hard part. From given H, it computes, uh, sorry, from given R1, R2. So you give it as input R1 and R2 and the fact that something, oh, oh, here we don't need anything. Uh, what am I doing? Uh, R1, uh, this is wrong, okay? Uh, we need to give R, no, sorry, uh, yes, this is wrong, okay? We don't need, okay, I made a mistake. So we don't need the, I will have to think during the break how to, how to fix this, but there's something, something is confusing me deeply. Uh, technically the type of ER should be dependent on H, not just a function type. Uh, what, 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 what? Yeah, no, uh, here, yeah, maybe, okay. Yeah, so alpha and beta shouldn't be there. They come for free, okay? So I will, I will, I will, I will think about this during the break and I'll write it out here so that uh, it becomes clear. So, um, no, we can, what is the time? 1720, how are we doing on time? Equivalence is 1735. Okay, let's spend, so let's look at the exercises because it's kind of nasty if we don't have this right. So one would be, okay. So the exercises are going to be this. If you have, <coughs> if you have propositions, then they're equivalent already if you just have maps between them, you see? You don't even have to, if you just have one map here, one map from P to Q, another map from Q to P, then they're already equivalent because 
not only will they automatically be inverses of each other because p and q have at most one point they will also actually form you will get an equivalence um, well yeah that's the answer right so and then um an improved version of this is that the map that you will construct that goes from here to here is actually an equivalence b is maybe homework and c is also then homework and then you do the same for sets that for sets there is no difference between i oh here i can fix this one this one because i defined it this one for sets if x and y are sets then isomorphism and equivalence are the same that is to say the trouble really is in the higher dimensions and because x and y don't have anything interesting in the higher dimensions they're sets all identity paths are boring are trivial so because of that uh you get an equivalence here so if you have x and y which are sets you don't have you can just take isomorphism and then the last one is this uh, universal property of uh truncation you can express it um using 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 that something is an equivalence and so in this case it's, it's easier than the product so what i suggest we do is we go out to a break then I suggest maybe we think about two is maybe more productive than one. I don't know. Pick the group that your breakout room can pick something to talk about. And I'm going to fix this while 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 you're gone and then tell you what the correct thing was. Okay. Any questions? Oh, people are already fixing things. Alpha and beta should not be there. Other the types. Okay, yes, okay. Yes. I think I did the mistake was that I tried to stick in alpha and beta. Something needs to be simplified to for this to, to work. Okay.